<laughs> well, Philadelphia and two New Yorkers. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. We'll start in just a moment. Are you calling me a New Yorker, Arthur? <laughs> no, I was referring to someone else, Ellie. What should we call you? I'm a New Yorker, but now I'm a Fort Lauderdaleian. <laughs> now we have hecklers already. We just started. <laughs> My favorite role. <laughs> Hi, Arthur. Hello. How are you? Hey, how are you? Very well, thank you. It's so dope. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Arlene. Uh, hey, Arthur. It's Gary from Las Cruces. Hey, Gary. How are you doing? Doing great. Glad to see you. Good to see you. Well, good to see your name. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Uh, <laughs> you are entirely oh allowed, my. I understand. This is and the first Shelley, book talk we've had, we've had hecklers. This is awesome. <laughs> and Shelley Rothenberg from Oakland, California. Hi, Sheldon. <laughs> it's Arthur. Hi. Hi, Arthur. I'm glad I can at least talk, if, even if you can't see me. <laughs> hey, Phil, you're sitting behind your wife, huh? Next to. <clears throat> yeah, okay. we're both here. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Colleen Stovall, and I'm the Director of Programs and Events for AAA Miami and for the Miami Center for Architecture and Design. Welcome. I'm going to ask you all, if you wouldn't mind, um, if we're all done heckling, uh, Arthur, to uh, turn off your um, audio and video, because it's going to help us with bandwidth, um, and it'll make the presentation go a little bit more smoothly. Also tonight, um, there's going to be a Q&A session, and if you could put all of your questions in the chat, um, I'll get to those in, at the end, and we'll, uh, we'll pepper Arthur with questions. Um, before I introduce him, um, well, I'd like to say Arthur is an architect, a photographer, and historic preservation consultant living in South Florida. He has mm -hmm. his own architectural student a studio and has had it since 1992. He's a native of Philadelphia and graduated with a BA in political science from Temple University and a Master of Architecture from Carnegie Mellon University. Arthur has a, had a long history of civic activism in South Beach, serving on many organizations as well as being the chair of the then combined CMB Historic Preservation and Design Review Boards. He currently serves as the vice chair of the City of Fort Lauderdale Historic Preservation Board. Um, architecture and photography have been lifelong passions from an early age for him and we're so lucky to have him with us tonight to talk about his new book The Architecture of Whimsy. So here is Arthur Marcus. Good evening everybody. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm really honored to be here on behalf of uh, MCAD and the Miami AIA. Um, I am here to talk about my new book, The Architecture of Whimsy. And, you know, whimsy is typically defined as perhaps a joyfully odd behavior or an impulsive or illogical ca character or a capricious, something capricious, but to make something fantastic. And all of these characteristics define this particular subset of 20th century modern architecture in South Florida. So I'm going to share the screen a little bit as I start talking because I'll show you some of the pictures from the book and try and get it organized here. So um, the first slide I wanted to show you, this is from the Clevelander Hotel in 1951, added onto its pool by the architect Robert Swartberg. And I had taken this photo when I first moved to South Beach back in the mid 1990s because it just struck me as these wonderful details were untouched at that point and in their book on Miami architecture and the AIA guide Alan Schulman, Jeff Donnelly and Randall Robinson Jr. beautifully described the pool constructions in this photograph. Set at an angle to the street the long concrete canopy is supported by metal bean poles and topped by a neon backed aluminum letter sign spelling Clevelander. An undulating fish and duck pond stretches along one side. At the end of the canopy, a roguish concrete disc supported on curving limbs conveys the imagery of a flying saucer or a mushroom or perhaps even a lily as seen from the bottom of the pond. 
However, before we jump further into mid-century modern, I think it's important to look at the architecture happening just before the war. And this would be uh, especially the years 1938 to 1941. These years saw record numbers of buildings completed, especially on Miami Beach, and marked the transition from the Art Deco architectural style to the streamlined modern style. This is, this at 800 Lincoln Road was the original Burdines department store on Lincoln Road, designed by the architect Robert Law Weed. And this is one of the first streamlined modern buildings on the road. The building, as you can see on the right, has now been sensitively restored and added onto by Touze Studio Architects. So, and they actually, the addition is in a separate color. So the historic building really shines forth in this photo. Um, Another building on the road was the, uh, this is the Goldwasser shops. Most recently, it was the Next Cafe, and I believe it's slated to be an Amazon superstore. My presentation today actually goes beyond the scope of my book, which highlights my photographs of these mid-century wonders. In addition, tonight I'm including historic black and white images of some of these buildings to assist in telling their fuller stories. These historic images are not found in the book. Historic images from Miami and Miami Beach are courtesy of History Miami, and images from Fort Lauderdale are courtesy of History Fort Lauderdale. I'm doing everything. I'm doing the, the pictures and the text, so it's a real challenge in coordination here. Um, I want to go back to one thing, because what I love the, the picture on the left of the man peering into the window because in the reflections, you see that by this late 1930s, Miami Beach already had its essential streamlined character intact, such as, and you see the reflection of what used to be the Sony building and the Lincoln Theater. Um, this building really stayed pretty much intact. And when I moved to South Beach, in 1992, all the storefronts were empty. Um, this was actually what I like to call the cafe scene on Lincoln Road. Imperfect Utopia was a studio, the studio of the artist Carlos Betancourt. And at the time, I thought it was a perfect description of what South Beach and South Florida was to everybody, an imperfect utopia. Um, most of the rest of the building was vacant at the time, but that was the nature of Lincoln Road. And lunchtime at a cafe often meant that just sitting on the curb with your lunch and a good friend, as can be seen here. Uh, but 1939 was also the year of the New York World's Fair, which was instrumental in this new style because it adopted streamlined modern as its official style. This firmly cemented the style as the preferred architectural design of the moment and was incorporated everywhere from buildings to toasters. And in fact, as a child, I can even remember our streamlined toaster. I always admired the design and I never knew why. Um, in 1941, the Plymouth Hotel was constructed and designed by the architect Anton Skislowitz, who paid direct homage to the fair and to the tower. The Albion Hotel was also uh, built in 1939. The picture on the right was taken in 2007. And the Albion was one of the first urban multi-use facilities, including a hotel, an office building, retail shops, and restaurants. The Albion was also the first to have a pool deck with underwater viewing of swimmers, which was a real hit back then, through porthole windows, as well as having a sand beach sun deck. Um, and this idea of the underwater portholes, which actually copied also in the Eden Rock in their pool. In 1939, it was busy, busy years. On the left, you see the Latin Quarter nightclub on Palm Island. I do not know who the architect was of, of, of the Latin Quarter, but um, it's, it's a beautiful design in the streamlined modern style. The nightclub was actually owned by Lou Walters, who was the father of newscaster Barbara Walters. And on the right, we have in 1940, 1939, Hoffman's Cafeteria, AKA Jerry's Deli, AKA Warsaw Ballroom, 
also known as the Warsaw Disco, and also known as Senior Frogs, most recently. And this was designed by the architect Henry Hohauser. In 1941, we had the Sterling Building, which was a redesign of two formerly existing Spanish Mediterranean buildings on the road in the streamlined style by the architect Victor Nellenbogen. It also must be noted, I thought it was interesting that Nellenbogen had his architectural studio on the first floor of this building for many years. So I guess when they were choosing architects, he certainly had uh, a good in with the owner. In 1941, the Collins Avenue skyline shows lots of construction. And, I, and I, I'll tell you how I know it's 1941. The third tower from the left, you can see the scaffolding still completing the construction. This was the Ritz Plaza, which is now the SLS. And this was completed in 1941. On the left of that, the second from the left is the Raleigh Hotel completed in 1940. And the one on the extreme left is the Shelburne, also completed in 1940. Further down, you see the dome of the National, but you don't see the Delano, because the Delano was not built until 1948. This picture is interesting, because in my mind, construction froze during the war. Nothing happened for the five years that the war uh, was on. It intervened in everyone's life, and normal life just ceased very similar to what we're undergoing today. But this urban picture in freezing the picture of Miami Beach, this is what hundreds of thousands of US servicemen and women who passed through South Florida during the war would see and would remember. And these images of a futuristic new white city remain with so many of them as they returned home to California and Kansas and, and Ohio, with many of them returning to South Florida with their families after the war because they basically probably couldn't get the palm trees out of their dreams. The war finally ended in 45 and then construction actually struggled to keep up with the pent up demand for housing and every type of building. Uh, one of the first major buildings after the war was certainly the Fontainebleau. And this was in 1954. Um, I find the, I, I, I like this iconic picture on the left of the Fontainebleau in construction and being built around the former Firestone Mansion, which they used as the construction headquarters, which would then be uh, demolished to make way for the Fontainebleau pools and, and uh, gardens. The Fontainebleau was designed by the architect Morris Lapidus. Um, one of the things that was used to be used to be fascinating about the Fontainebleau was the Trump Loy mural, which one would see you would you'd be driving north on Collins Avenue, and you'd see what looked like this mirage. And what happened was this was the view that one could originally see of the Fontainebleau, but at some point, all these buildings got built on their property as the property expanded and the, the campus expanded. So in 1986, they hired the artist, a very noted muralist, Richard Haas, who painted everything basically, if you see the two women holding the baskets on their heads, the one on the right, that, that begins the, the mural and the whole rest of the building is a mural. And it's fascinating because you do, it does seem to feel as if you're looking through to the view of the hotel. This was destroyed in 2002 when even larger buildings were built here. Uh, other interesting buildings uh, in during this time is certainly the North Shore Band Shell by, I, um, by I'm sorry, I have it right, by Norman Giller. And what I, I, I think is fascinating is the gravity defying entrance canopy which looks like a structural tour de force. And it certainly brings to mind the entrance canopy of the Shelbourne Hotel. The Shelbourne differs, even though it was built in the same year, because it has the three T on the left side of the, of the photo, uh, the three columns that anchor the circular entrance port cochere. One of the, in my mind, one of the most spectacular buildings in uh, MIMO buildings in Miami Beach is Temple Menorah in, in North Beach. 
Uh, it started in 1951 on the left by the architect Gilbert Fine, who designed the very rectilineal building as offices and classrooms. And then in 63, uh, Morris Lapidus came along and designed the beautiful Belvedere Tower with a viewing platform on top and the cheese hall facades and the, uh, the vaulted uh, sanctuary on the right. It really all goes together. So it's nice to see when two architects are able to work together and can integrate all of the, the uh, elements of the building in one. A little bit in Fort Lauderdale, I do jump around. I haven't quite organized it by geography as I did in the book. This is the Manhattan Tower. It was designed by the architect Charles McCurahan. McCurahan had only one building in Miami Beach, the Alexander Hotel, but he was the mid-century architect in Fort Lauderdale. He inspired a whole generation of other architects. This is a fascinating building because it was built originally for housing for General Motors employees. And this was the entrance tower that actually really, be, the signage becomes the architecture in this. And a few buildings that are no longer with us, the Deezerland Hotel that used to be at 87 and, and Collins has been demolished, but it, it was originally by Albert Annis and features some wonderful grills on the front facade that Hot, hid the windows as well as the air conditioning units. I thought that was a nice solution uh, prior to central air. And then we have Morris Lapidus on Lincoln Road in one of his follies. I've arbitrarily labeled them one, two, and three just to differentiate them. Um, you can see the Miami Beach Community Church in the background. And this is a um, Whimsical is always the word that's used to describe this. Another whimsical Morris Lapidus folly is folly number three, which actually holds a small memorial plaque to Morris Lapidus and a fountain. It's the only one that has water. And so the whole sculpture actually becomes a fountain. Um, sorry. On the left, we have the Yankee Clipper Hotel. And the Yankee Clipper was designed, I, I don't have the date here, um, it, the Pier 66. This is what I use for my cover sheet. I find this building fascinating. I know it looks kitschy, but the more I've lived with it and the more I see it from different angles, the more impressed I am. I thought it was very unusual that this is the one occasion where out-of-town architects uh, really knew how to create a joyful ode to South Florida, while at the same time evoking a little bit of Frank Lloyd Wright in his tower designs. The architects were Robert Humble and Todd, Todd and Wiseman, who were basically corporate architects at the time for the hotel chain. And uh, on the, the next slide, we have the Bay Harbor Continental which was designed by the architect Charles McCurahan and had the beautiful inlaid brisole wall with the beautiful, the colored glass inserts. Unfortunately, this building has been demolished. And in, 19, in 1959, Charles McCurahan also designed the Birch House. And what's interesting is that the glass inserts that we previously saw on the Bay Harbor Continental were also used, you can see in the Birch House, although there were far less of the colored inserts. And because this wall in the Birch House has a solid backing, you lose the sen sense of depth. And the sense of depth in, in this one, in the Bay Over Continental, really enlivens the facade and enlivens the building. So it's interesting. I've always found it interesting when you follow an architect and see different details and see how they're used in different buildings and how they were developed. One, I have to explain what you're seeing here. This is the Times Square Shopping Center in Fort Lauderdale, different, different shots of it. This was a, basically a mid-century modern urban landscape, all done by Charles McCurahan, much larger than a square block. And this beautiful corner picture in the upper left with the Tempur-Pedic sign 
uh, shows the original brick facade. And, and he did a number of intricate brick facades that were different throughout this little townscape. He had modernist forms and he included lots of different materials. Unfortunately, what has happened is now on the right, this is what the building looks like. The, the brick screen has been taken down. Many too many uh, windows are showing up with uh, no logic. And unfortunately, this former landmark qualifies for death by a million cuts. Unfortunately, the city of Fort Lauderdale was not able to do anything, but this just indicates the need for stronger preservation rules to protect buildings like this. One other building that's been threatened is the, Pan the former Pan Am Latin American Division headquarters just north of Miami International off of 36th Street. And this, I took these colored pictures in, my gosh, back in like 1999 as part of the Urban Arts Committee of Miami Beach when they did the initial survey of MIMO structures in Miami. And we set out to educate the public on the benefits of mid-century modern. And honestly, we didn't know how successful we would be, but it was nice to see. I don't know, honestly, if the building is still there or what shape it's in. It was modeled after the, um, the embassy that was designed in, um, in, 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 in India. Uh, also in Miami Beach, we have Triton Towers. Again, I, I do not have the, um, this is actually, I do. This is Watson, Dushland, and Cruz Architects. And there's a certain geometric rhythm to the building that I've always appreciated. Another building, unfortunately demolished, is this small hotel building in Lauderdale by the sea. The, the outside on the left is very unprepossessing. You wouldn't know what's inside, but you walk inside and I was just amazed at the impact this had on everything. I mean, it's just the different forms. I had to print it in black and white because unfortunately it was painted so many glaring colors of orange, red and green and blue that I've learned if I show a picture like that, all you see is the color and you don't get a sense of what's behind the color. And I did want to show the forms here because I think the architectural form is what's really important. This is a small residential building on Dickens Avenue in Miami Beach designed by the architect Leonard Glasser. And I, it's, it's emblematic of having one design element that really shows off the building with flair. And I think this building does it beautifully and it's remained very classic over the years. It's hard to believe it was built so many years ago. And then in Fort Lauderdale, Breakwater Towers is a fascinating example of Charles, Charles McKeerahan's architecture. The entrance is this striking tensile shell sculptural concrete entrance pavilion and it leads to the 16 story building. Uh, it's in the mid century style and it's, it really, um, he what I like about McKeerahan is he was one of the architects who would use his free form style as a counterpoint to his geometric style. And the meshing of the two really uh, gives the building character. And as I sometimes say, gives the building a little bit of gravitas. Mid-century modern is really the style of Fort Lauderdale as it came of age. By contrast, in Miami, the mid-century style is but one of many architectural styles evolving over time in concert with the city's growth. This is the Sunrise Bay Club in Fort Lauderdale, also by Charles McKeerahan. And I show the building, the picture on the left, only as a reference, my photographic reference, because I remember looking at this building going, I know there's a picture somewhere. And I finally did find the picture, the one on the right but it did take a little bit of searching and I'm glad I spent the time to do so. Uh, the Sea Tower is another monument in Fort Lauderdale designed by the Miami architect, Igor Polovitsky. One of the things I was trying to do in this study and this analysis was to show that the same architects 
worked in both cities. They weren't separate. They worked in Fort Lauderdale. They worked in, in Miami and Miami Beach. And there was, there's a spontaneity to the architecture that I think they all shared. There's a joy that's built into this, these whimsical forms. Um, another, this is, um, I was going to show a whole series of screen walls, Brie Soleil's, which I have in the book. And this is a fascinating one. It's at the Four Seasons Condominium on Sunset Drive in Fort Lauderdale. And it's modeled after the top is flowers. It goes down to snowflake, then to maple leaf for our Canadian friends, and the sun. And it's all cast in concrete panels that were then tilted up and formed the wall of the garage. So I thought it was a very creative way to uh, embark upon a different kind of detail. And then, of course, what would whims I talk about whimsy be without the Casablanca Hotel in Miami Beach? I had almost forgotten this and was driving up Collins Avenue, stopped at a light staring at it, and I said, how could I have forgotten it? So it was needed to be included. But now one of the things I've noticed in doing this study is that whimsy has always been around. There's always been an elephant element of whimsy. Back in the, gosh, in the 17th and 18th centuries when they started building glass pavilions to grow oranges, these were these glass pavilions were considered as whimsical structures. So I'm trying to look ahead from the mid-century modern into contemporary architecture. And there's a number of examples I just wanted to throw out to show this continuity because the forms that you see in mid-century modern have certainly evolved. On the right, we have the Marina Blue Condominiums by Architectonica. And on the left is a small building on A Street. I don't have the architects here, I have them written down, uh, but this is right next to the former Versace store. And way back in 92, they, they actually did something. And then of course, when you talk about whimsy, the Buckminster Fuller Dome has this element of whimsy. It certainly feels that. On the right is how it appears now in its classic setting at the Miami Design District. And the left is an interesting photo. I took this, uh, must be when Art Basel first started and they had, I think Craig Robbins had the uh, dome set up on an empty lot and people would just walk through. There was no line, there was no admission. You just walk through, take a look and then admire it and walk on. And I happened to look at this picture, the purple one on the left a number of years afterwards. And I'm looking at the woman going, is that Beyonce? Now, I don't know. There's not enough detail. It certainly could be, but it'll be a secret for the ages. So I thought that was an interesting uh, slice of life story. Another bit of whimsy is this, uh, these wonderful additions done to the Royal Palm and Shortcrest hotels in Miami Beach. These actually form the visual terminus for Ocean Drive, if you look up as you walk up Ocean Drive. And these were also done by Architectonica. It just happened that a lot of the um, whimsical buildings I have been attracted to were Architectonica's, as is this one. This is in Fort Lauderdale. It's the central bus terminal. It's actually no more than a facade and it forms the emergency entrance from the bus terminal. Uh, there's just a walkway in back. I think it was built, I know when I moved here in 1992, it was already existing, so it was before then. Uh, but I just, there's a creativity and a whimsical quality to this that I've always enjoyed. And I certainly wanted to include it tonight. One other piece of whimsy is certainly what we used to call the Chia Pet Garage at 7th and Collins in Miami Beach. And when it's grown in, it really does uh, look wonderful. I had my doubts about this when this was first proposed, but I must say, although it looks like the green blob, it really tends to disguise the overwhelming mass of the garage behind the historic buildings that were retained. And then of course, there's the Herzog and de Maron parking garage at 1111 Lincoln Road. Um, maybe whimsy is not the right word. I know I'm allowed to stretch the uh, meaning of the word, so I'm doing that tonight. And then of course, 
We also have this wonderful building downtown by Zaya Hadid Museum Park on Biscayne Boulevard, which is a wonder in itself just to walk around. It's um, something that I need to go back and take a better look at because it's, it's a difficult building to capture in photographs. And then of course, we have the wonderful lifeguard stands by Bill Lane. And this is just one of many, many. And I saw Bill somewhere on the call. So um, we all have always appreciated these. And then for whimsical inspiration, there's always been the uh, Wynwood Walls. And this was the Goldman building, the original one in, my, in Miami. And uh, it's still an inspiration the way it was done. And of course, there's the rest of Wynwood, which uh, I must give my apologies to the artists because I don't have the names of the artists, but uh, that is the, the language is the art. And as the one uh, cartoon says on the bottom, art is my weapon. I, I like that. So I wanted to thank you. That was a little bit of my story of how whimsy runs through our architecture. Part of it is certainly from the um, fact that we're a, a resort, we're resort towns and we sit on the ocean. But there's a, there's a, I think this brings a little joy into the architecture that we're doing and, and that we've seen, and especially in the 40s, after the war ended, society was full of joy. And they say architecture does mirror society. So I think the mid-century modern architecture mirrors its society very well with its architecture. So thanks again to MCAD and AIA Miami. Colleen? Yes. Um, well, we've had some people wondering how they can purchase your book. Uh, it is on Amazon. If you just uh, type in the architecture of whimsy, it should come right up. Um, and if you want to support uh, the Miami Center for Architecture and Design, before you go to Amazon, go to smile.amazon.com, select the Miami Center for Architecture and Design as your charity, and then go ahead and do the search for the book. And um, it won't cost you anything extra, but Amazon will give uh, MCAD a little uh, donation. So if you um, want to do it that way, it says an extra step or two, it really will help us out. So, um, Let's see, uh, uh, I'm looking for questions here. If you have questions, anyone, please just put them in the chat and we'll get to them. Let's see. Do, do, do. I had a note that I told people when you were showing the North Beach band shell, I was told that that was used as a TV studio for Merv Griffin. And they would put the big television cameras up on top of those round uh, elevated discs and yeah. they're built to withstand thousands of pounds of giant TV cameras. So I, I did not know fun. that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Carolyn Kleps says, uh, regarding your Deezerland photo, please point out that the eyebrows were not really green. I remember you said it was just the lighting at sunset. Is that true? Well, actually, wait, I'll, I'll, I'll try and put it on again. I think I have it here. Hold on a minute. They were painted green, Carolyn, at the time that I did take it. Um, but I, I don't know for how long. They were painted in these Christmas colors. The, the fins were the green and the edges were red. I remember succinctly because Collins Avenue was still a two or three lane road and traffic was moving very slowly. Um, but I, I know that's not the original color and if it were being renovated, we certainly wouldn't recommend they painted that color. <laughs> but it made a great photograph. Uh, well, Linda Taylor asks, how much were the new materials in mid-century responsible for the whimsical forms? Uh, well, it's interesting, Linda. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> um, sorry, I'm having trouble with my light here. Um, the, the new materials were very responsible for the forms because during the war, um, they developed a lot of new materials. When you look at the concrete, they developed special admixtures for the concrete. And this enabled them to get the kind of spans that you can see on the North Shore band shell. So the, the concrete could be stronger. The, 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 the height of the 
uh, plate could be less so they could look thinner. This one I'd actually, it's interesting on the North Shore band shell, it's made to appear very thin because you only see a very thin line. But if you looked underneath, it curves down and becomes much thicker in the middle. And that, that's how a structural engineer would design it. Could you share that with us so we can see it? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I, I thought <laughs> I did. I, I'm still learning here. Just a moment. Oh, wait, you're going to have to give me a moment here to do this. I will no share worries. it. Okay. I, I, I'm learning that I, once I close it, I have to open it again. So you're probably seeing everything I'm seeing here. Nope, not yet. Oh, not yet. Oh, good. You're good. Okay. <laughs> so what was everybody's favorite building or um, whimsical detail? Throw them in the chat if you want. If you don't have questions, throw that in there. All right. So now... <laughs> Okay. There we go. There we go. Mm -hmm. So what I was looking at and trying to share with everybody was the North Shore band shell. This is the one that with the war research creating different admixtures for concrete, you could create a longer span with a thinner weight. So this is the one that's very thin at the edge and it goes down and is rounded uh, to become thicker in the middle, which is how the structural engineer would design it. Wow. And as I was mentioning, this is the other one, the Shelbourne, but this has supports in these three columns at the other end of the driveway here. Oh. So it's just, it's interesting. There was a lot of uh, effect of the war. I mean, floor plates became thinner, air conditioning was developed, um, plastic piping originally started there. So there were a lot of innovations that really spurred on the construction in the 1950s and beyond. Let's see, I have another question. Let's see, here's one from um, Karen Reddish. Was the whimsy driven by the clients or by the architect's design philosophy? Um, I tend to think it was by the architect's design philosophy, depending on the type of building they were doing. I mean, you have to remember that many of these buildings especially in Miami Beach in this, were hotels and more commercial buildings that served the resorts. So I think that's what drove it, you know, and I do think um, when you're doing a hotel, you want uniqueness, you want your brand to stand out. And it may have been a combination of the owners and the uh, architects. And also with the streamlined quality of some of these buildings in the late thirties, everybody was still trying to save money. Oh. So. Let's see, Mark Cohen asks, does any of this remind you of Temple Road on an inspirational <laughs> basis? <laughs> I think I'm going to- Thank you, Mark, for that question. Philadelphia, is it? We grew up on Temple Road together <laughs> in that area in Philadelphia. And honestly, Mark, the reason I love this is that nothing reminds me of Temple Road. I mean, it was a great place to grow up, but um, it, it, it was a different time and a different era. Um, what I love about this architecture is I find it inspiring. It's been inspiring to me as a designer and an architect and as a historic preservationist. So I hope we can continue to see more of this architecture, stay around for more time. I can only imagine what people uh, coming onto the beach or into Fort Lauderdale, you know, from the more conservative places up north and encounter these buildings. I remember the first time I encountered them, I just, I was gobsmacked. I couldn't believe it. It was, it was just magical seeing these. Oh, uh, I agree. I, I used to, I lived in Seattle before I moved down here. And needless to say, the weather was a little different. But I had fallen in love with the Art Deco buildings and I discovered Woody Vondrasek who did these wonderful minimalist posters for Miami Design Preservation League. And that's what I had on my walls. That was my inspiration. Mm -hmm. So when I finally came to Miami Beach, um, 
I had done my research, so I knew what to look for. Mm -hmm. But it, it was funny. The first time I came to Miami Beach was probably in the mid 80s to visit my Aunt Lena, who lived at 67th <laughs> and Collins. Everybody had an aunt somewhere there. And I was afraid to get out of the car when I drove down to see the Delano. It just, I mean, maybe I was a little innocent, but everything looked just a little sketchy. But at the same time, the town was fascinating. I couldn't get enough of it. So when you said, Colleen, that you were gobsmacked, <laughs> that was the impression I think we all had upon seeing this wonderful concentration of deco buildings. I had the same experience moving to Fort Lauderdale five years ago because I never knew much about the post-war modern buildings up here, but I have been just amazed at the amount of buildings and the quality and the fear that they're not gonna be around for too long. So part of the reason I've taken so many photos is hopefully South Florida won't get flooded, but at least we have some kind of photographic record of some of these. Mm -hmm. um, someone was asking if they can re-view um, this presentation, and yes, it will be available on the MCAD website after, uh, on, I'd say go Monday, um, and we'll have a recording of it on Monday. Does, Does anyone it, need to log, log in, or can they just go onto the website? Uh, it'll be right on the website, and there'll be a link you can just click to view it. Um, and um, does anyone have any, any more questions? You can put them in the chat. And um, I have another question for you. This might be very obvious, but when I know that, um, you know, in the, I guess the 80s, they started recognizing the Art Deco District and really made great, um, with Ellie Schneiderman, I believe, efforts to preserve it. Is there a similar um, movement to preserve the, um, the MIMO type of stuff, things from the 50s? Well, in Miami Beach, there certainly is because so much of the city is now a uh, part of different historic districts. In Miami, the only place is the Mimo Biscayne Historic District, which certainly has a great concentration of mid-century buildings. Unfortunately, in Fort Lauderdale, it's the opposite. Most, if not practically all of these mid-century buildings are located outside of the historic districts in, in Fort Lauderdale, which mainly preserve the older homes, the early 19th century neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's a real danger as development ensues. Luckily, these buildings have stayed around. They're still pretty much intact, except for the few that I've shown you. But the pace of development is really picking up in Fort Lauderdale. There's a lot of building going on. So there's always that danger. Mm -hmm. My boss just corrected me. Uh, she said, not Ellie, but Barbara Kapitman, Kapitman yes, Barbara Leonard Kapitman. Horowitz, and MDPL. So, Ellie Schneiderman was the Art Center of South Florida on Lincoln. Oh, Road. yeah. Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> I didn't even catch that. So. <laughs> Uh, so, um, if we, uh, let's see, uh, Arthur, uh, this is Anna Marie Stewart. Uh, which of all the buildings and photos are your favorite? Ah, Anne-Marie, thank you for asking that really difficult question. Um, I've all, I don't have a favorite. I have many favorites. I do like the band shell because I just like the audacity of this <laughs> thing just hanging out in midair. Um, I've always been intrigued by the Lincoln Road Follies um, that Morris Lapidus did, especially when they finally got the water working. The water did not work for many years. And also in Fort Lauderdale um, is Pier 66 remains a favorite. You realize since I put it on the uh, cover, there's just something intriguing about it. What I love about this photograph on the right is it certainly shows mid-century in the architecture, but suddenly you see the palm tree leaf and you know it's South Florida. So I, I like that combination. Let me see if there's anything else. Any other questions? Uh, lots of people thanking you for the terrific presentation. And let's see, I think that's it. Uh, people are telling us their favorite building. Um, let's see. Um, 
Linda Taylor says, Phil likes the bus station facade. Okay, Phil, <laughs> good choice. And uh, Sheldon Rothenberg says, uh, the Clevelander and the Trompe l'oeil. And oh, the, yeah. Louise. And uh, let's see, I think that's about it. Uh, yep, that's all I have here. Let's see, Arthur, will you be, oh, and my boss, Cheryl Jacobs says, Arthur, will you be an MCAD guide? of mid-century in Miami. We're gonna put you on the spot. Yes, <laughs> that's the right answer. Good, yeah, that's the best answer right. at all. We, we need to put together a, a guide and let people um, find out what's here in the city of Miami. Uh, well, you know, we should build at. on, you know, 20 years ago, like I was saying, the, um, the Urban Arts Committee that had a number of people in the, in the community as a member I was not one of the prime movers and shakers, but there was a lot of work done in terms of identifying buildings. And I had some information I can give you on that. Mm -hmm. oh, that's wonderful. Let's see, um, Stephen uh, asks, can you talk about the intersection between photograph and architecture? I guess photography and architecture. Well, the, it's interesting because I know Stephen, you're a photographer too. Um, being an architect, when taking a picture of a building, what I have found is that um, I, I want to I want to do the magazine shot. I want to take a great picture of that building. And what I so appreciated about these buildings is, yes, as you can see here on the left, there are some black and white grainy photos of the building when it was brand new but very few pictures give these buildings the due that they deserve. Um, so, you know, there's, a, there's an intersection there. I mean, it's the architecture that inspired me. And again, I, I usually zero in and sort of try and frame out extraneous pieces of the puzzle so that you're only like, like here where where is the picture? But then this is what I wanted to show. I wanted to show the constant movement of these circles going up and down the stairs. Because when you look at this photo on the right, your eye almost doesn't know where to go because it keeps moving. So I find that fascinating. That's one of the things I appreciate about your work, Arthur, is your, um, you, you find that detail, the one detail. You know, I think most of the time you don't try to take a picture of the whole building, but you find that detail that really represents, I think, what the architect was trying to, um, trying to get across, like those that, circles, the movement in the stairs. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm second guessing to try and find out what, what the architect was uh, trying to do, but <laughs> we can try, you know? So, but there's one thing I have found in South Florida and which I knew, but I, it's been confirmed the more I delve into different projects is there is such a wealth of architecture in South Florida. Some has, have been well-documented such as the buildings, such as the Albion in uh, the historic districts in Miami Beach. But um, I find when I talk about some of these wonderful buildings in Fort Lauderdale, and I talk to my, uh, my friends in Miami Beach, they have no clue about these buildings. So it really is almost two separate cities. So I hope this can bring us together a little bit. I have more questions for you. Karen Reddish uh, said, if you watched the marvelous uh, Miss Maisel TV, Mrs. Maisel TV show, do you know uh, what hotel lobby they used when she was in Miami? I believe they used the Fontainebleau lobby. Oh. I think it had the big chandeliers, if I remember. I'm going to, that's my... 80% guess. I think two other people uh, concurred. Steve did and Gary Knight. They both good, said it good. was the fountain blue. <laughs> so Arthur, if you uh, have any um, parting thoughts for us, any last thoughts about this subject or and anything, any new project you're well, working now, on? I'm, I, right now, uh, my parting thoughts would be that um, I hope I've helped to inspire you to the wonders of some of these 
wonderful buildings. And as you're driving around, I hope that maybe you'll recognize some and maybe we can all be the, little, the better off to keep these for future uh, generations to enjoy like we have. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you everyone, again, if you want to, um, let's see, where else am I looking at? Uh, I was just looking to see if there were any more. Eh, we're done. Um, we're done. <laughs> um, if you go to um, www.miamicad.org, uh, after Monday, you'll be able to find the link to this presentation. And uh, Arthur, it was really a treat to have you with us tonight. And thank you so much for sharing your book. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. Everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, Arthur. <laughs> it's funny when you can't talk to everybody and you'd like to. Do you want to? I can leave yeah, it on. That's no? okay. Okay, bye. We'll talk privately. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, okay, thanks, Arthur. Bye. 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 Good to see you. Talk to you soon, buddy. <laughs>